Hey everybody, welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Um, today I'm having a returning guest back on the show who's been on here a couple of times before, Joshua Wren, uh, a friend of mine and poet, fiction writer, nonfiction author. Most recently I had him on the podcast to discuss his book, How to uh, Read and Write Like a Catholic, which was published by Tan wonderful book that I still highly recommend. And uh, today I'm having him back on to discuss uh, his his debut novel. He's done uh, two collections of short stories, which we also discussed in our first interview. But um, this is his first novel, Infinite Regress, published by Angelico Press. And um, this is actually the first of two interviews. Um, I don't think they'll be back to back, but you know, in the near future that we'll be doing with Joshua, because he also just published a significant um, essay um, called Contemplative Realism, a Theological Aesthetic Manifesto, which a lot of people are talking about. I'm really looking forward to getting into that as well. But today we'll be just discussing infinite regress. So I'm very happy to have Joshua on the show. Welcome. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much, Thomas, for having me back. And it is, of course, a, a real honor and a joy uh, to be able to converse with you again. Um, well, uh, do you think I should just read the the like the synopsis from the the back cover? Would that be the best way to start? I, 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 I kind of feel it is a good way to kind of root us in the in the plot. Yeah, yeah, but I feel like that's the most efficient way because the the, the other way would just be to do the same thing essentially, but with more like hemming and hawing. Well, the um, other the other way is to just you know them by you shall know them by their fruits. And I can say that I just returned from Houston where I did a reading. And I sold enough copies of the novel to be able to buy my wife a cat, uh, which <laughs> she's been uh, petitioning me for for I think wow. fourteen years now. Um, and I, yeah. So you know, anybody who tells you that you can't make money with literary fiction, don't believe them because <laughs> our house will now have not only four children, but for the first time ever, a cat. That's unjust, very exciting. The unjust judge was finally persuaded. <laughs> so. That that is awesome. Uh I, you know, but I have no idea how expense how much a cat costs, so I can't actually <laughs> tell how many copies you sold uh based on that. Right. Um But yeah, the, I the thought cats cover. were free. I mean, I see them all over the place. <laughs> that's <laughs> That's that's true. Yeah, basically uh I think you know, probably I could just walk out the front door and and uh and catch one, but <laughs> okay. Just to give people an idea of what the book's about, in the years since his graduation from St. Marquis University, Blake Yorick has fled his family and Milwaukee, rotating from job to dead end job, working the back end oil fields in Dakota, and even signing on as the night caretaker of a rural Abbey graveyard. Deep in student debt and estranged from his misanthropic, alcoholic father, Blake is haunted by the memory of his mother's death and by his relationship with his college mentor, a defrocked priest named Theo Hape, who is known for his adventurous theological ideas as well as for the uncanny, seductive power he wields over his students. When Hape, learning of his former charge's desperate straits, proposes a perverse exchange of services, Blake finds himself tempted to test the professor's radical theories in real life. What follows is a metaphysical duel reminiscent of the novels of Dostoyevsky and Bernanos, bidding a modern-day antichrist against a reckless but resilient young man and his well-meaning, dysfunctional kin. Uh, so, would it be fair to call this a novel of ideas? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with that uh, description. I know that there's, you know, kind of an, a raging debate that will probably never end uh, in terms of how much a novel should directly engage ideas. Mm -hmm. And there are, for a long time, the ascendant opinion was that there is really no kind of meaning that you can extract from a novel and that all fiction is sort of non-ideological or anti-ideological, amoral, etc. Um, yeah. But I think that there's a there's just as robust of a tradition, and maybe even a more robust tradition that en engages I ideas directly. In fact, uh, I think that it was uh, I forgot which Eastern European novelist said that basically every 
every novel is a thesis novel, right? So there's always uh, some sort of thesis operative, whether it's Jane Austen's Persuasion, or it's James Joyce's Ulysses, or uh, something like Willa Cather's Death Comes for the Archbishop, which doesn't really seem on the surface to have a lot of ideas floating around, but there are very much sort of these warring conceptions of the nature of reality or why what we're supposed to do with our lives, how we're supposed to live, um, that the characters are kind of, you know, dramatically um, arguing with one another about by their very lives. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think that in, in the case of Infinite Regress, of course, a lot of the ideas are put forth in the dialogue itself um, and in the minds of the characters. And that is sort of fitting because a number of the characters, not all of them, but are sort of intellectually inclined, right. whether it be Blake, who's a former student, who is kind of a, an exceptional student. Uh, Theo Hape obviously was a professor for his most of his life. And uh, even Max, Blake's brother, is a psychologist who's sort of lost his faith in psychology. Uh, but so it would be sort of bizarre if these particular characters did not have a lot of lively ideas mm -hmm. <laughs> about things. Um, at the same time, uh, the novel, I, I took great care to make sure that there are also characters in the no novel who are not sort of driven by these fixed ideas or you know, my, monomaniacally focused on on some sort of theory. Mm -hmm. uh, you have Dymphna, Blake's younger sister. You have Catherine, his mother. Um, and uh, you have, I think, Father Marto, even though he's willing to engage Garrett, Blake's father, in a lot of debates, drunken debates, where, well, not Father Marto, but Garrett is drunk most of the time. And he's willing to engage these ideas because that's what Blake's father wants to talk about but he's also uh, not primarily an intellectual, you know, after all, he's, his main work is rebuilding this uh, abandoned Benedictine monastery in the middle of the ghetto in Milwaukee. Um, right. And so, and playing basketball with the kids right in the neighborhood. So, um, so yeah, but there, there are a lot of explicit ideas that are, are engaged. Yeah. And then uh, I would say Rick, uh, Dalt and Helen Sheen, two of the other characters, sure. are yeah. the least intellectual in the, the story, probably. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, um, what, what what does this idea of infinite regress, uh, how does that function in the story? It comes up in a number of different ways. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, so on the one hand, Theo Hape uh, argues that basically all attempts to state definitive things about God or morality will end in an infinite regress where you're sort of trying to justify one thing by backpedaling to a, an earlier premise, which requires an earlier premise, which requires an earlier premise or an earlier cause. And the Hape's position is that you will just continue to go backwards and back further and further backwards eternally. Um, and so there's no possibility of finding that firm foundation mm -hmm. for any uh, of our understandings about God. Um, and so, you know, it operates in the novel in, in that sense, in that he's explicitly advocating for that understanding of our relationship to the divine. But it also um, operates, I think, thematically or narratively, in the sense that a number of the characters are moving backwards, even if it is ultimately to be able to uh, be purged of something that enables them to move forward, there's a kind of a need for a temporary retreat, yeah. um, and oftentimes unwillingly undertaken, that could have gone on for years or for a lifetime, where let's say, for example, if this was a novel that was trying to dramatize uh, a kind of psychological determinism. These characters could have continued to go back in their own biographical histories to find the traumatic origin of why they're uh, the way that they are, uh, 
Right, um, right, right, right. And they could have just continued to do that yeah. interminably. Yeah. But instead of doing that interminably, for most of them, at least not for all of them, but certainly for Garrett and for for Blake, there is uh, an endpoint to that regress that disrupts Hape's theory um, by sort of sobering them, waking them up. In the case of Garrett, it is a memory of him trying to teach his son to play bas uh, baseball, excuse me. And at first he was, when he took his son to practice, he would get sort of disgusted by uh, the amount of sort of verve and uh, kind of brawling crowd like crazed crowd like activity that he observed among the other parents who he said he thought took these sports way too seriously and so he let that kind of poison i think you could say one way of putting it is that it kind of poisoned the understanding of sports as a as a as a right and good sort of expression of a young man's you know coming from into manhood and instead he saw it as just this kind of uh crock um, and then he, in ruminating on all of this, remembers the, uh, the baseball, basically to resolve this dilemma, he saw that his son still wanted to play sports, but, um, he didn't really have the gumption or the heart to help him. And so he bought a, a pitching machine, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that he wouldn't even have to throw the ball to his kid. Um, and he's sort of sitting there in the basement ruminating on that and he finds this onion and he imagines putting an onion into this pitching machine and there's this image of the onion again as this thing that you could just kind of peeling peeling away layer after layer after layer but then in this case you you would arrive at you know the core which is his failure as a father um, and he accepts it mm. very very much too late uh, to be of immediate help to his son, right? His son is in dire straits and has already gone through with a, a, a number of heinous uh, actions. But he nonetheless, it is this kind of propulsory moment that propels him then instead of backwards forward to, for the first time in his life, go out and meet his son instead of waiting for his son to come uh to him begging him to be a good father um so that's that's you know a num those are a, num a, a number of uh instances where infinite regress kind of plays out there are, there are others right uh, but I th yeah uh, what's interesting to me about the character of theo hape is um well he, he's this uh as the the what we just read says he's a defrocked priest specifically a jesuit and he had been the uh in charge of this this preparatory school this high school um uh saint ignatius j riley um uh, which obviously Correct. is a reference to confederacy of dunces um uh and he was um defrocked by the vatican uh laicized for um sexual behavior with some of the young men at the school and um yeah. And he ends up becoming a college professor and he uh, sort of mentors people in nihilism, basically. Um, he, he mentors them in in deconstructing everything. And uh, and he he uh, he proposes this exchange with Blake um, that in exchange for sexual favors, he will pay off. A big chunk of his student debt uh and um he he says this uh he says something uh at, at some point he says something like you know i could get this from any man but what i'm trying to do is teach you uh philosophically by this action um that you know our bodies are meaningless that gender is meaningless and you know yes. and uh our sexual organs yes. are meaningless um yes. and so I mean, this sets him up in a way as this um, uh, this sort of like monstrous. I mean, he's described as a modern day antichrist on the back cover of the book. Is this this monstrous figure? This sort of like you know evil for evil's sake kind of figure, 
and then, and I'm going to spoil it a little bit by saying this, but <laughs> but uh, by the end of the book, he, well, I guess he's always uh, like taken down a little bit from this sort of cosmic cosmic scale of evil because of the way he talks and he, he's sort of the way he hems and haws while he speaks and uh, something about it is not as sort of like impressive as this grand force of evil, you know, as mm. that, that you might expect in an antichrist. Right. But, but, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but um, by the end, mm -hmm. he, he yeah. even has to admit that he has not been choosing mm -hmm. evils for evil's sake. He has not been to, mm -hmm. or he has not been choosing. I would say nothingness is, is more to the point. Nothingness for nothingness's sake. He has not been choosing negation for negation's sake. He's been seeking, freedom all along yeah. and yeah. also uh you know his his claim that he is uh you know simply you know trying to educate you know Blake through sexual acts you know seems to fall flat because he he comes across in the end as kind of pathetic in his his neediness um that's right uh in this final confrontation that they have and so um, by the end, he's he's completely deflated, I would say. And so that's yeah. what I found interesting yeah. about the character is because on a philosophical level, you'd expect him to be this um, – there's like this parallel – there's this like divergence between the philosophical ideas he's espousing at first and uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and his actual character, which is kind of lame, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's a really insightful reading, uh, and I'll refrain from saying whether or not that fulfills the authorial intent because I don't know what whether the author wants me to reveal what his intention was <laughs> okay. uh, in writing that character. Um, but I I think that uh, you know so if if, if I could uh, sort of speak into that by pointing out that when he first meets uh, Blake York, there's a kind of crucial scene where. Blake is on campus and there's a kind of uh, climate controlled uh, section or environment on campus where there's a, a poison ivy plant that's growing and it's kind of growing very profusely. It's sprawling all over the place. And when Hape first meets Blake, Blake is yanking the poison ivy out of the ground uh, almost maniacally, right? Sort of getting rid of it. And Hape comes up to him trying to be of assistance, uh, stepping in as if he were, you know, the redeemer, the helper, to warn him away from this plant because uh -huh. he doesn't want him to to be hurt by it. Um, and lo and behold, he finds out from Blake that the reason that Blake has been pulling it out in the first place is that when he was younger, their mother fed them this goat milk <laughs> that was actually, um, you know, from goats that chewed poison ivy and the poison ivy then therefore, you know, by ingesting it, it produced this kind of immunity to poison ivy on, on, in the, on the part of Blake. And so he's doing it for the sake of anyone else on campus uh, so that they wouldn't get poison ivy. That's Blake's motive. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's a crucial scene on a number of levels because, well, you can see that the roles are already kind of reversed from what Hape wants them to be, mm -hmm. right? He he is not this kind of deus ex machina character who he wants to be. Mm. Instead, Blake is doing just fine on his own. Um, but then immediately when when uh, when Hape realizes that that is the case. There's a way in which he he he's a master of sort of tilting or tilt. He's a master sophist, of course. So he he's he's able to to tilt the scales of that conversation in his favor by launching into this argument, uh, apologia in defense of things like poison and black holes and plagues and all of these things that are part of our world, that this world that God created and and called good that nonetheless seem to be innately evil. Um, and he does this in order to kind of champion things like the need for poison ivy. Um, and Hape's whole position is that you can't really understand or appreciate anything that we like to conventionally call good without the negation of that good standing right next to it. Um, and so 
we need even people who would say, well, you know, poison is bad are, are in Hape's understanding kind of reliant on poison so that they can point to its opposite and celebrate it. Um, but he is, uh, he is, I think, in that conversation, in spite of the fact that he does have these highfalutin kind of ideas, you can tell that there is, I think you're really, that was a really insightful way of putting it, that there's, that, that he's, there's a, there's a real vulnerability in him, um, that he would rather not let these kind of protégés know about. Um, and I think that part of the reason that they're attracted to him is precisely that. Does that make sense? So, right, I think these young people kind of see the vulnerability in him. There's a way in which, even though he's professing to be their liberator, they're taking pity on him mm -hmm. in a way. And then it's this kind of, you know, the chemistry is perfect in the sense that it binds them together, but it's obviously, you know, an awful yeah. uh, amalgam of Well, that's of, the final play he makes to Blake is actually playing on his own vulnerability. Uh, that's right. Yeah. 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 I mean, he tries to basically, you know, yeah, uh, appeal to to some version of love that that, that that's right. what he was he was seeking to love Blake all along or something. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, well, it's just interesting to me that that, um, you know, he's claiming these this philosophical grandeur, but obviously, you know, uh, these theories are impossible to even live by. In real life, so they're always sort of they're they're sort of collapsed into just normal human weak motives, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so much of the time, even if there is all this intellectual pride and uh, stuff that he has going on as well, um, at the end of the day, there is this just sort of like brokenness and neediness that he ha that he has, um, as yeah. as we know, because I mean, he himself was yeah. you know abused. Uh, by yeah, an older yeah. Jesuit priest who I, I don't know right. if you're trying to refer to anybody specific in real in real life because you never name him. You, you say a famous 20th century Jesuit uh, thinker, but um, yeah. Well, I I guess what I can say is that there are kind of prototypes of hape in real professors that I've known, hmm. real priests that I've known. Wow. Uh, and real priests that I know of from other people's experiences. And so, right. uh, you know, obviously I developed all of that. And as, as any fiction writer, what you end up doing is, you know, you take sort of three character traits from one person, two character traits from another, and maybe some of the physiology of a third person and you have a character. <laughs> um, right. And so that's that's sort of how he came into existence. But uh, but no, I mean, I actually witnessed a professor who uh, was doing similar things and that he was, you know, preying on these young men um, and, and, and posing as a as someone who was kind of alleviating their guilt and um, eliminating all of the, the kind of hang ups that they had. I will say that, you know, I do think that it's not quite the case that Hape doesn't live by these theories. I mean, just to cite one example, uh, as pathetic as it might be, this is really, you know, he does put it into practice insofar as he intentionally moves into the suburbs and lives in this kind of like highly Republican neighborhood that he hates mm. um, in order to kind of mock with signs in his front lawn, He including this kind of bizarre cutout of Napoleon uh, that he puts up there in his front lawn uh, in order to kind of mock all of the, the people who have their, you know, pro-life signs or whatever it might be. Um, and so he, again, sort of his take on that is that he's doing them a favor because he's presenting them with an easy enemy and human beings really do love to, hmm. you know, sort of harp on and, and hate people who have different positions in them is sort of his idea. Uh, but it also strengthens his own um, commitment to his own positions because he's kind of so disgusted by, you know, the people who he surrounds himself right. with. Um, so, yeah, and I, and, I, and I guess, you know, it's, it's, in, it's interesting. What is interesting is that, you know, earlier on in the novel, in the early pages, you, you have Blake kind of smitten with this character named uh, Max 
uh, Clapperman. And uh, Clapperman is sort of like he's one of Hape's proteges. Right. And Blake meets uh, Clapperman before he meets Hape. Um, and he's totally taken with Clapperman because Clapperman is sort of by contagion sort of picked up the way that Hape carries himself. He'll go around into the neighborhood and rouse all of these sleepy people and get them to come out and have these kind of knock down, drag out political arguments in the, in the coffee shops and the pubs. Um, and I think that that is evidence that actually Hape, again, is an efficacious mentor, unfortunately. Do you right. know what I mean? Right. Um, and it also, sh but it also shows, I think, that he has perfected his ability to pray to a degree that someone like his protege, Max Clapperman, uh, never does because it's it's important that Blake ends up not really being totally smitten with Clapperman for long. Once he meets Hape, mm -hmm. right, he sort of puts all of his chips um, in that uh, fish and chips basket. So Right, right. Yeah, yeah well, um, he's trying to reconcile good and evil in a way um, and – and uh, sort of relativize them, and and through this sort of dialectic, he's also blurring the lines between them. Um, there's a line uh, when and there's this whole scene where um, Blake first attends one of Hape's meetings at this bar, and um, at the end he, um, well, it's in a slightly different context that he uses this phrase, but it, he he describes the appeal of this seen as a marriage of heaven and hell, which is, of course, yes. exactly what Hape is trying to accomplish. Right. No, very much. Yeah, that's that's absolutely accurate. And yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, there's also there are, there's also an attempt, maybe more so in what he's advising Blake to do than than what he does with his own life, you know, more so at least he wants Blake to marry uh, ideas and action or, mm. you know, theory and life. Right. Um, and so there's all, there's all sorts of ways in which I think you're right to use the word dialectic. He wants these things that typically remain sort of oppositional and polarized to be smashed together. Um, and there again, I mean, I, I have to say that, you know, that's that uh, some of those things that I'm exploring, you know, I, I think this probably won't be, won't sound outlandish to you, Thomas, but I think people who have not spent a lot of time in universities, kind of post-Catholic Catholic universities or uh, or state universities, don't understand really how bad it can get. Mm -hmm. um, and the things that that people who are you know tenured professors who are sometimes academic superstars are able and willing to espouse. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, at my alma mater, one of the professors they kept her on staff because she was really uh, famous, but she wrote a book where she argued that basically sexual abuse can only happen from a man to a woman. It can't happen from woman to woman. And lo and behold, she herself was taking advantage of her female students and right. uh, she success successfully yeah. defended this action in court. And then, you know, to, to use another example, I mean, I think that uh, there. I remember one of the first days of class, we were sort of supposed to describe our areas of emphasis. And this was before kind of the explosion of uh, gender and company. And one of the my fellow students said that she studied queer theory. And I said, you know, could you please kind of define that? And uh, basically, right, this came up because well, this question of what she was studying was germane to the class because we were studying Plato's Phaedrus. And there's, you know, some different kind of homoerotic gestures maybe between Plato and his his own disciple. And it was amazing to me that all of the other ideas that Plato's exploring in there were totally dead to the class and that the only thing that people were interested in focusing on was the, the question of his sexual relationship, right? And um, so she explained gender theory as the exploration of deviant sexual behavior. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I basically said, oh, so you mean like celibate Benedictine monks? <laughs> and that didn't, you know, go over so well. But, um, <clears throat> but 
so I think that sometimes, right, these uh, there there was a there was a desire to treat some of these things in the novel in a kind of carnivalesque way, you know, having taking them seriously, but also having some fun with them, right? Because some of it is just so absurd, and yet people right. are devoting their entire lives to you know uh, proselytizing it. Yeah, I'd like to come back to that that fun aspect of it later. Um, sure. but, uh, yeah, it's just striking that, that all your, everything you're talking about is so current. I mean, um, you, I don't know if you've been following mm. this whole, like this whole, the, this new language people are using about like groomers, you know, mm. grooming and groomers. Do, I, do you know what I'm talking about? I, I haven't. Okay. Well, so there's this basically in the past mm. few months, uh, mm. there's been this sort of exposure of um people pushing uh sexual deviance on children like public school teachers mm -hmm. basically oh right bragging right, about right. this and and uh this has been ex more and more publicly exposed and then uh it, not to go into all the details but there was a thing where like disney was uh florida was trying to make a law against talking to kids in school about this kind of stuff and then disney was you know protesting did, yeah, it and then that. basically disney mm -hmm. was taught a lesson by the consumer on this and had to mm -hmm. sort of back down and a lot of other companies sort of distance themselves from their support for this stuff so but this mm -hmm. it, it, in the midst of all of this this sort of like this term groomer started to be used mm -hmm. not just for people who um were themselves you know uh sexually abusing kids, but also who were simply teaching, blurring mm -hmm. these lines for kids in the way that they yeah. taught them and actually teaching them. Right. And I think it's entirely appropriate, actually, and especially because so much of the time it turns out that there actually is something more than just, you know, intellect ideas going on. You that's know? right. Well, um, and that's, and that's, you know, and that's something that really haunted me from my experience in graduate school is this kind of, you, you, you did find that there were students who would speak kind of openly and favorably about the possibility of paying off their student loans by becoming prostitutes. I mean, quite literally, right? Mm, that was right, openly espoused right. uh, by some of my colleagues. Right. Um, and then you had others who would talk very big about sort of all of these liberations. But then when it came down to particular instances, you could see them getting kind of squeamish. Um, and that's something that th therefore I really wanted to explore that in the novel. Um, so that would be the be Blake Yorick side of the equation there. Yeah. So Blake is someone who, again, I think is, you know, completely goggle eyed over the possibility of all of Hape's theories being true, because if they're true, right, then that means that his entire, the entirety of his Catholic heritage, his Catholic faith, that his mother sort of left to him, his father is a kind of skeptic, like a Wittgensteinian kind of skeptic, but his mother, you know, was a devout Catholic, right? At one point, her husband's face is described as the same color red as the bottom of Catherine's foot when she walked the Camino de Santiago, right? And so there's a, there, was an, a, there was an attempt on his mother's part to, to bring his father closer to the faith, but he described it as basically every time he tried to come closer to faith, I know I'm digressing just a little here, but I'll circle back around. Every time he tried to come closer to faith, he said it, it felt like it did when they were at Notre Dame in Paris, which they went once together, and he tried to climb the bell tower, and he became, as he got closer and closer to the top where he would have found faith, right, he became claustrophobic and, and ended up kind of spiraling down and running away. So there you go again, you have that regress. Um, but so Blake is sort of torn between his mother and his father and that he has that kind of dual inheritance, but he's sympathetic with his mother. Uh, I think especially on the level of the heart, he experienced love from her in a much more immediate uh, and efficacious way. And so he's, 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 you know, he's loath to let go of the faith for that reason. But on the other hand, right, all of the demands that doctrine and dogma make on a, a soul is not very attractive to him. And so he hopes that what Hape is saying is true. But then when he tries to, to live it out, he ends up reeling and, um, and is basically 
completely disgusted and nauseated by by what he we, what he ends up doing. Hmm. The more I look at you know postmodernism, the more it seems to just exist for the purpose of justifying pedophilia, you know, or if not hmm. pedophilia per se, then uh, in the strict sense, then at least like you know the love of boys, maybe adolescents, sure. you know, um, and. Uh, Speaking of regress, it's, I was thinking about this the other day because it's like it's almost like philosophy began with like getting us away from that, in a that's sense, right. you know, yeah. like that's what it feels yeah, I mean, like. Plato I mean, think- and Socrates are moving away from, you know, and right. then and then yeah. and now philosophy is like has ended in trying to return us to that. Yeah, I mean, right? I, it's a, it's. I mean, you know, to become obsessed with Plato's sort of either purported or real flirtations at the beginning of the symposium or at the beginning of the Phaedrus, right, is to ignore what Alcibiades says at the end of the symposium where he was sort of, you know, infinitely frustrated with Socrates for, you know, the fact that he had to lay next to him all night without being able to sort of, you know, falsely consummate anything. Um, and of course, you know, Diotima's speech about right. moving from right sort of particular bodies upwards, right? It's to ignore all of that. So you're, yeah, I, I, I totally agree, right? Um, that there was this kind of turn away from it, even though it's, you know, it, it's sort of uncomfortably, right, sort of present, right? Uh, in a number of Platonic dialogues right. and other ways, yeah. But there's this interesting, um, you know, I was saying postmodernism seems to exist to justify pedophilia. pedophilia. Mm-hmm. Then when you move specifically to queer theory, you know, mm-hmm. so many of the leading lights of queer theory did justify pedophilia. Um, yeah. And so yeah. there's that aspect of it. Like there's all this flashy intellectual work that's just ending up justifying like the most debased sins of the flesh. Right. That's right. But then there's the other aspect yeah. of it, which is also referred to in this novel, which is that like – the sins of the flesh also ultimately you know the enemy of satan is god more than it is like little children so mm-hmm. so you know the the, the point mm-hmm. actually it, it like goes in both directions like mm-hmm. so like mm-hmm. one can justify the other and maybe that's the motivation for people who get into some of these ideas right but mm-hmm. but then on the other hand the motivation of the evil one is to attack mm-hmm you know, being itself. So there really mm-hmm, is that right. grand metaphysical conflict as well going on in these actions, that's in right. these transgressions. Um, and right. that's yeah, what that's, children, that's and that's what children are taught, you know, when they're abused. Yeah. Uh, so. That's, yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there is like, on the one hand, it's like this intellectual pretension to justify, you know, animalistic behavior. But on the other hand, there's, there's uh yeah. The fact that there actually is a cosmic war going on. So yeah, and I mean, I I know that there are to, on balance. I mean, I'm sh- I know that there are you know sort of uh, Frankfurt Marxists right who genuinely believe that capitalism is the root of all evil, and they're not totally faking it. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Uh, I might yeah. dis you know I disagree with that. I do think that they're onto certain things, mm-hmm. and actually even Pope Benedict cites them favorably. And I think it's Deus Caritas, or at least sympathetically, right? He open in an, in a kind of open way, right? And, uh, but um, but yeah, I mean, in in many cases, it is just a a sort of a ruse. So, yeah. Um. So I wanted to um I wanted to ask about the style, because we've talked about your writing style a little bit before in our first conversation, I think, um, and it's it's even more perhaps the case in some of your earlier short stories where there's this kind of st- almost stream of consciousness style, and yeah. that for me that manifests itself now in this novel more just in the kind of like unusual analogies and metaphors that you come up with um, where there's this kind of like odd, like oblique imagery being used. That seems to be uh, it seems to be, you know, incongruous with, with the action taking place. And yet it also lends it this, in some cases it lends it this like comic, note mm-hmm. which you were mentioning sure so is that yeah i mean i i i guess i'm interested in both in the comic aspect of it and the way that it functions here but also in like how you how you ended up having this writing style because it's not just in this work you know um and it even comes yeah. across in your nonfiction sometimes like you you, you obviously yeah. love you love to 
sort of like spin out uh spin out a phrase in a sort of an unusual way or so yeah yeah i mean it's it's a it's a great question and i wish i had an answer to it in the sense that i think part of it is just that that is uh that is part of the raw talent that i've been given and i don't always use it well um you know especially when i was writing as a you know i didn't i didn't go to undergraduate i didn't think i was sort of college material um and i didn't begin until i was 22 and so i was writing a lot of poetry and i if i look back on that poetry now it's basically just a lot of kind of wordplay and associative mm -hmm. you know associations um and I, so i i can see that the the beginnings of what i en ended up trying to kind of develop into more of a you know distinctive style later but i um you know i i didn't set out you know consciously to kind of have it it just that's the way that my imagination grasps things i do think that what i'm trying to do is to well fulfill what i've told all of my writing students that i will fulfill until the day i die which is my uh, endless war on cliches i, I declared mm -hmm. a war on cliches many years ago and um I, I don't think that any, you know, even if you're a pacifist, I, I'm not willing to give you a dispensation to get out of this. Uh, there's a difference between, by the way, something like a genuine folk saying or folk wisdom, which might sound kind of like a cliche, but mm -hmm. is like really a, a pithy kind of wonderful treasure that we shouldn't get rid of and a cliche, which is a sort of a dead on arrival I see. Um, way of portraying something that is basically a mummification of that thing. What would be an example really of that? Get at. Uh, well, I mean, the famous examples are from Flannery O'Connor's uh, short stories where she has this kind of everyday cliche nihilism of her characters who say things like, well, you can't win them all. You know, you only live once. Uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. Right. And right. the things that they're discussing, right, are are so significant that to try right. to kind of treat them in that. Which is a big source of the culture. humor of her stories, I think. Yeah, it's, 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 it's hilarious. Um, and so, um, so part of it is, is really just a, a, a strong desire to get at the nature of things at reality, the way things are to, mm -hmm. to, to allow things to irradiate their essence, their nature, their right. being, what, what they are, um, in a way that is maybe strange or unusual, but that nonetheless is faithful to some of the paradoxes, you know, and the tensions that exist in them. And, you know, I am just in general on this point, I'm uh, a real, uh, I'm really grateful to Pope Benedict for his address to artists, because unlike in other quarters where there's all the, I know we've talked a little bit about this before, but where there's all this talk about sort of, you know, beauty in a kind of oversimplified way and being in a, in a sort of a overly um, maybe abstract way. Mm -hmm. I think Benedict talks about beauty as being a paradox, right? Mm. And fundamentally, it's paradoxical, partially because you have both genuine beauty, the real article, like Catherine Yorick, who's very beautiful, her soul is very beautiful. Um, and she's also beautiful physically. Um, and then you have sort of the Luciferian beauty of someone like Hape, who is you know, really attractive to a lot of people in this novel. Um, and, and so there's a paradox there. Right. And there's a paradox, there are, there's paradox. I see paradox in many, many, many places in our daily lives. Um, where I think, um, you know, I notice that it's oftentimes just ignored or oversimplified. Um, and so part of it is really that just that desire to draw out paradox, to draw out a manifest mystery where it exists all around us. Um, and to achieve that, sometimes what that means is that a sentence is going to kind of pull in two directions at once, or it's going to, I'm going to advance one metaphor only to actually mid sentence correct that metaphor instead of deleting it, leave it on the page, right. <laughs> correct it, and then offer something that is more accurate because then you can kind of see both by negation and by positive instantiation, kind of the truth about things. Is there um, maybe um, a brief excerpt you could read to give people an example of your style? Yeah. So this, just to set up this scene, this is Blake York. He has uh, fled his job on the working on the Bakken oil fields in North Dakota. Uh, and he's 
making his way back to Milwaukee, but he's not really ready to go home yet because he still has this kind of unresolved irreconciliation and tension with his father. But he's back in Wisconsin, so he's moving closer to home. And he's working as a sort of security guard, making these figure eights <laughs> around the, the landscape of a, of a, a, a monastery uh, cemetery. So on the quietest nights, fluorescent torch staked into the soil. He went so far as to clean the dark green lichen from the stone inscription so old that there were no grandchildren left to come and make known the names of the dead. He'd bought a dental tartar scraper at the dollar store and scratched at the plaque with great patience, repeating the names of those past, terrified sometimes when the letters lost legibility even after he cleaned them, disintegrated into garbled symbols that meant nothing to him like a foreign alphabet learned long ago but now cut off from memory. He had to blink to figure whether the confusion was on the stone's end or in his head. Nice. There is this sort of comic aspect of the story, and there's a sort of um, a daringness to certain aspects. Like I mentioned the name of the high school that a number of the characters attended uh, being St. Ignatius J. Riley. Now, you make no attempt whatsoever to justify a Jesuit high school having that name, you know, uh, is, is, is that, is that, uh, you know, was there a Saint Ignatius J. Riley sometime between the present day and the time in which this story <laughs> take, takes place? You know, are the Jesuits, you know, naming it humorously, deliberately? It's, I don't think we're, I don't know that we benefit from thinking about it too specifically, uh, you know, true. other yeah. than just appreciating it as kind of like an absurdity and like a, you know, a mockery of the, the school itself, perhaps, you know, in the yeah, story. I think that's right. I mean, I think, I think it's, you know, if there is a kind of, uh, if there is a kind of symbolic heft to it, it would be along the lines of just, you know, sort of a, a poking fun at and having fun with and laughing over. But also there is a kind of, you know, uh, echo of, of melancholy in, in, in the fact that this is kind of representative of the gong show that has become Catholic educations in many quarters in this right. of our country. <laughs> Do you right. know what I mean? Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, and I'm also, you know, sort of just uh, cribbing off of uh, my forebears and that, you know, you have, I don't think that there was yet or is yet a, a, an order of, of Leibowitz. Uh, so, right. you know, Canticle for Leibowitz. Right. And then there's also not a, a Clementine order you know, to, to, to reference J.F. Powers, uh, Mort de Urban's mm -hmm. novel, where he basically invents from scratch this religious order. So yeah. yeah, but it gives the story a kind of like a parodic flavor. Um, yeah, there is. Yeah. There's, 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 there's plenty of irony, uh, you know, <laughs> as do in, in some of the novel. things surrounding, you know, racial politics in one section of the story and, you know, various, yeah. various other things that are clear, very recognizable from the present day, but they're given a sort of like funhouse mirror. I mean, to, to, build on the car carnival metaphor that you used um look yeah. where it's it's not exactly what we're seeing today but it's kind of the same dynamic played out in a in a more cartoonish way perhaps um yeah. but not that much yeah, more cartoonish um yeah and then yeah. in terms I of mean, the think... names of the characters too you know you, the, the character is named blake yorick which is like <laughs> again you know th there's i don't know if anybody today has that name but there's a uh there's uh you're just putting it out there and we don't have to think about it too much in realistic terms it's just like there's a character named rick adult you know and and it's just like have fun with it you know this yeah. is we shouldn't take it as like a totally realistic uh thing yeah no that's right i mean yeah so there's there's I, one thing that I really I, I love the novel as a form, and I love it for so many reasons. Uh, not only because it it allows us to take everyday life uh, seriously, but also and because it has this kind of unrelenting development and insistence upon explorations of the psychological and spiritual depths of characters that really is kind of unparalleled uh, in other art forms. Mm -hmm. But also because it's just it, it it is a kind of here comes everything kind of form in that it absorbs other literary genres. And it in this novel, for example, it even absorbs the form of the police report. 
So I think right. that there's a there's a part of the novel that's told in the form of a police report, and it goes on for something like ten pages. Right. Um, and it reads a little bit like this. I'll just read a, a tiny little excerpt of that police report. Sure. Um, on seven o one twenty blank A D, at approximately sixteen thirty hours, white male Sergeant Peach was flagged down and advised by reporting party black female Destiny Zanheep who stated that there had been an assault on the corner of Martin Luther King Jr. Drive and Howell, where approximately 300 persons had gathered for a permit-approved assembly entitled White Lives Matter, a celebration of Western civilization. White male victim Garrett York informed white male Sergeant Peach that he had been running an errand with foster child, black male child Byron, when coming across the permit-approved assembly and, quote, recoiling over their premises, he paused to engage in a, quote, friendly and outright academic philosophical disputation with white male assembly organizer Reinhardt Spender when white male assailant Kurt Kampf shouted, seek Heil. Um, and so basically, right, I mean, uh, the, the, and, and, and I, and I want to. Uh, and we've got more of those of, names in there, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, you know, I do want to say that the, the, again, the intention here is both to show the absurdity of trying to do away with things like race and gender. I mean, you know, in the very form, it's inescapable. Um, but also, this is a sort of white, uh, you know, white power rally, basically, that uh, Blake's father, Garrett, is running an errand for his wife, Catherine, who's very ill. He's going to the Sig and, Sig and Pig, which is a very famous uh corner store in the novel. It might not be famous outside of it, but it will be someday. There will be a Sig and Pig um, where you can get, you know, a pound of of, uh, of good roasted pork and uh, six rolls on a Sunday for a, for a steal. Nice. Uh, and when they go, when he goes to run this errand, um, he finds that these white power people are using Aristotle and other sort of foundational texts of the Western world to argue in favor of slavery, to argue in favor, favor of natural slavery, and to argue in favor of their, of their sort of racial prejudices. And he is kind of, I guess, either guileless or stupid enough to think that he can actually engage in dialogue with them. And so he begins to cite Aristotle's categories where Aristotle basically says, Aristotle expressly says that it is not of the essence of a man that he is white for the same man can now be white and now be black right. um, at a different time. And so, yeah, I mean, there's just, there's just all this kind of, you know, sort of all these, these things, these gems that I just came across in teaching in, in a great books honors college for years that work their way into the novel. But, but on the other hand, I mean, Blake is, I mean, excuse me, Garrett is absolutely dead serious about his argument. Mm -hmm. And I, I also want the reader to, take this in a dead serious way in the sense that we're I'm trying to really get at these questions about what is man right and what is right. what are the accidents of human nature and what are the what is the essence um and yet when this happens on the street in a rough neighborhood of Milwaukee it leads to a fist right yeah yeah is the setting um you're from Milwaukee am I am I right I am, yeah, born and raised, and it's very okay. much in my blood. Yeah, mm -hmm. the place where they live is this really rundown, super dangerous neighborhood uh, where the Yorick yep. family lives, and uh, yes. um, and I, I'm curious is that is that a reflection of modern day Milwaukee, or is that a projection into the future of current trends? Or oh no, very much. I mean, it, it's I I I live back in Milwaukee now after seven years exile. Uh, and in many ways, I, you know, thought of this whole experience of writing Infinite Regress really was a love letter to my city hmm. uh, in many ways. And uh, in spite of all of its brokenness, I mean, it's a very broken city, but it's also a very beautiful city, right? It has a lot of rich heritage architecture, um, jazz culture in the, uh, you know, sort of the, the black neighborhood that was ultimately displaced by one of the interstates, uh, Bronzeville, hmm. uh, which the novel deals with that sort of you know, displacement, uh, at some length. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, since I came back home, 
the the murder rates and car theft rates have just multiplied mm. beyond what I can keep up with, and it's kind of dizzying. Um, but no, we we I my family and I lived in a neighborhood that was very similar to the one that 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 uh, the Yorks live in in the novel. Um, you know, where you'd have to sort of you know you run to your car from your car to your house and hope that you don't get shot and um, you know, people are getting their hands cut off in the alley and things like that. So, mm. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's very familiar. It's also Milwaukee is one of the the most segregated cities in, in the country. Mm. Um, and so there's just a lot of racial tension and strife that exists here in a way that I haven't encountered in other places that I've lived. Wow. Um, it's sort of very visceral. You can feel it. And, you know, that's partially, you have things like the suburbs around Milwaukee would literally write into their founding documents, you know, no blacks right. may live in this suburb or things right. like that. Right. So, I mean, there's, there's a reason for, uh, this animosity and tension. Hmm. Um, and, uh, and yet, yeah, I mean, I, I love, I love this place. I, I do its home. So these characters, particularly Blake and, uh, Garrett, Yorick, uh, the, the son and the father are really trapped in this, like this, this intellectual deconstruction of everything in uh, of existence itself, certainly of the existence of God, of good and evil. Um, and how, yes. how is it in a general way, I'll ask without, you know, spoiling plot details, how is it that they are able to, um, to break loose of that? Right. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, so, I mean, I think that uh, Blake begins to, undergo his conversion of sorts or his he comes to the threshold of a kind of return to convert the possibility of at least conversion uh, precisely through committing an act of of evil mm -hmm. that was supposed supposed to be harmless right and uh, i know we addressed this a little bit earlier but in that sense it's very much you know sort of a model uh modeled on raskolnikov and crime and yeah. punishment yeah, and yeah. that right i mean it's precisely through completing this murder that he has theorized to the hilt with ideas about Napoleon and socialist ideas about this lecherous pawnbroker. And he has all the justification and rationalizations in the world. And then he actually murders her and right. uh, he, his, it, it swells his consciousness beyond what he's able to contain. Um, and so that is really what uh, Blake becomes sort of so, so unexpectedly wounded by that that he uh, is finally willing to come home to his father's house. His mother has passed away at this point. Uh, even though when he comes home, he does so kind of incognito or sort of trying to, to do so in a way that his father won't be able to see him. So he climbs in through a basement window. Mm. Um, and yet this is the closest that he's come to being able to forgive his father, which uh, you know, he, he's definitely beginning to try to do, even at the beginning of the novel, um, he's open to doing that. And pr precisely what allows him to do that in the beginning is that he lives several states away, mm -hmm. right? So he has this kind of distance. He doesn't have to see him every day. He doesn't have to be reminded of all of his flaws and failures, and therefore he can kind of forgive him. But it is a kind of abstract forgiveness. And so um, that that is the trajectory for Blake. Um but, you know, on, on his way there, of course, there are other kind of comic uh, endeavors that, that kind of also contribute to his, uh, his sobering or his shedding of these different theories, including a stint that he does working as a, a, a call agent in a telemarketing sort of company that is um, called Calm and Collected. And it's basically... Um, he, he goes to kind of withdraw some money from the bank and then he's overdue on his student loan payments. So he actually gets arrested. Um, and, you know, one of the readers recently, uh, when I was down in Houston, asked me, you know, is this supposed to be magical realism or did that really happen? And I said, absolutely, absolutely. That really happened. You know, if these things don't exist yet, they will in a few years, yeah. um, that he's basically sort of told, oh, you know, we have this, these kind of accoutrements for you and you'll live in a, basically the equivalent of a student dorm. And, um, and then he doesn't stick to the script of what he's supposed to say when he's making these calls to other people who are in student loan debt and he gets fired. And there is this moment 
where then when he leaves his job, he's asked to leave his cell phone, which he thought was dead, the battery was dead, starts ringing and he picks it up and it's actually himself calling himself. Um, and uh, so there is a, a kind of possibility of him also undergoing something like a, 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 a psychic break. Mm. Do you know what I mean? In this novel, right. um, in the sense that he, so there's the positive instantiation that I just described, but there's also the fact that he is, he is, you know, the things that he's undertaken and the pain that he has in relation to his family and his father are so overwhelming that it does break him. Right. Um, and so when we see him at the end in the final scene, you know, there is some question about whether he may be slightly, you know, slightly off at that point, or I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm trying to present him as totally having a psychotic break and he's insane and he doesn't mean anything that he's saying or something like mm -hmm. that. But just that realistically, right, you can't go through all of these things and not be severely kind of broken by it. But it's precisely in the brokenness that he becomes open, right, to to healing. Right. My impression is that uh, student loans so often are subsidized by the, the government. And so you're never really going to have to pay it. Um, but is is there a are there yeah. a lot of cases in it, which that's I not mean, the case in which people are really sort of there are i mean, there there are enough cases where that's not the case that i mean i know people who you know uh have been in situations where they they've been threatened with the repossession re possession of all of their belongings mm -hmm. right because they wow. uh, defaulted on on back payments and so no i think i think you're right that in in some depending on the loan company it's the consequences aren't going to be that severe um, but yeah, I mean, it's just sort of playing with this whole bizarre situation that we find ourselves in where, right, in many ways we have, you know, more people being educated than ever before in this country, but the quality is, is watered, more right. watered down than ever before. Uh, that's proven by, for example, this NEA stat that is, I think said something like since 1981, the amount of people who got bachelor's degrees in this country went up 80%, something like that. And then the amount of people who read one book per year has declined by something like 75%. I might be exaggerating mm -hmm. a little bit. I'm Irish, but uh, it's a lot. Um, and so, right, it's sort of playing with that. And when Blake calls this one woman, right, she, she, he says, well, we're just going to repossess that part of your mind where the part of your balance that is not yet paid, right, is located. And she basically says, you know, take it all, right? You can take that part entirely because she conceives of her kind of college education as not really having taught her that much. And I, I don't want, don't get me wrong, you know, I sometimes make the mistake of going on Twitter and finding all of these trails of argumentation about like very anti-intellectual, right, sort of arguments that call for the abolishment of universities. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's absurd, right? We're, especially as a Catholic, that's, that's a, that's a ridiculous idea, but I mean these institutions are, are 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 rotten to the core in many cases, and so there is a need for founding new ones and a kind of total revolutionary, right sort of right. Um, reorientation uh, that that makes that makes again that sort of comic scene have some some teeth, uh, you know, some sorrowful teeth right. basically. <laughs> well, so how does this this idea of debt, you know? play out in a metaphysical way in this book. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, St. Paul uh, says that the only debt that we owe to one another is a debt of love. Um, and I've always been really taken by that verse. Um, and there's a, there's, there is a, a passage from the notebooks of Baudelaire that I really had in mind while I was working on this novel. And I didn't end up using it as the epigraph, but I had it there as the epigraph for a really long time. And he basically says, whenever a debtor comes to collect on you, just write something on an extraterrestrial subject and you shall be saved, mm -hmm. is his little notebook entry. And so I think his, his idea there is sort of like, you know, you can pay your material debts by writing about spiritual things mm -hmm. right sort of almost like even if you die a pauper like you will have made amends but i think that then later on in his life and wh auden sort of commented on this 
there's another journal entry where he basically goes through all of his wife and or all the people in his family and friends who he has debts that he owes money to. And he jots out like all of the different um, things that he's going to pay them back one at a time. And it's, you know, five francs to this person, 10 francs to that person. And then he concludes that section in his diary by saying uh, something like, you know, genuine work, even when it is disagreeable, is better than sloughing around and doing nothing at all, right? Imagining these kind of, you know, spiritual solutions to things that I should really be doing with, yeah. you know, putting my hand to the plow. Right. Uh, and so that that is sort of like a skeleton key in a way to the tensions that exist with, you know, Garrett. Um, uh, he was a sort of he was disillusioned with what he saw going on in academia. He he wanted philosophy to be a way of life, and it became an arcane specialization for people who like to get into hair splitting arguments over nothing. And therefore, he, for the sake of supporting his family, was doing things like working at a Botox factory. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's this question of, right, like, is that a good thing that he took on a job at such an absurd and superfluous right, sort of organization? Uh, these tensions between like doing duty to your family versus the larger cultural implications of certain kinds of work. Um, and then, of course, Garrett, after Catherine dies, just becomes a full blown alcoholic and doesn't really work at all to speak of. Um, and it is, I think, true that by the end of the novel, you know, there's a, a a sort of a synthesis of those those two attitudes in the sense that he's not that he goes out and gets a job, uh, and that's and then the not the 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 curtains come down, but he does actually have to do some physical work, and I won't go into what it is in order to sort of reunite with his 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 wayward son, um, and so right it's. That in that sense, there's much more of like a turn towards a metaphysical uh, understanding of of debt and and the debt of love that has to be paid. Um, and and I think that you know at the end of the novel, when there is that sort of uh, confrontation again between father and son, it's happening right near the the gravestone of the mother Catherine. And I think it's there's also a suggestion that. Um, that the debt of love that Garrett owes Blake is actually something that he really also needs to fulfill in honor of his wife, you know, who he, um, he also didn't really, you know, he, he was a failure towards his son more so than he was towards his wife. Uh, but almost like in order to, to, to complete their marital bond, um, after she's dead, he needs to uh, pay that debt of love to his son. So. There are other things too, like I mean, there's Dimphna, you know, and there's other characters who Dimphna is Blake's sister, and others who play into this dynamic. But I, I won't take us too right. far afield. You did use the Baudelaire thing, by the way. Oh, yeah, did I? you had three epigraphs, and that's the first of the okay. three. There was Baudelaire, uh, Parmenides, and Leon Blois. Okay, good. I'm glad that I left it in there. Yeah. That's that's hilarious. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> so I think. Oh yeah, you're right. It's right there. Um, so I took out the second part of the Baudelaire, which is that diary entry where he, you know, sort of just literally records his monetary debts. Gotcha. To his... <laughs> gotcha. Well, we were talking about the comic aspects of this. And of course, you know, the, the classical definition of a comedy is something that has not not necessarily something that makes you laugh, but something that has a happy ending. So, um, so uh, how did you approach creating a happy ending for a book that is so kind of unrelentingly dark in many ways. Yeah, right. Uh, well, so uh, there is a there's a point in the novel, and I was really gratified because one of the reviewers of the novel in the Los Angeles Review of Books kind of picked up on this when Blake is working at that call center. He starts thinking about his grandmother and his dad's sort of uh, attempts to deconstruct his grandmother's faith by saying that basically she believes in Christianity, which is a variation of other fairy tales. And, you know, as Tolkien famously says in on fairy stories, uh, all fairy stories have a eucatastrophic ending. Mm -hmm. That is, a, there's a good catastrophe. And so there's this question of writing a novel like uh, Infinite Regress, right? There is, if there's going to be any kind of a happy ending, it's also going to be riddled with catas catastrophe simultaneously or, right, a sort of smashing together of 
of of different figures and forces um and you know blake has gotten to a point where he really dismisses the possibility of happiness in this life or any sort of christian narrative um and i think that there's a way in which right that's not entirely part of that is not entirely wrong on his part in that you know acclim this is a very augustinian idea but like sort of holding out and putting your hope in this life sort of having an upward swing is uh, a kind of a, a delusion or a fool's errand because if we're going to hope for anything at all it's going to be things that we cannot in in things that we cannot mm -hmm. see and that would be the only thing that will not disappoint us uh but nonetheless you know there's a very strong uh i guess kind of thomistic um bedrock to this novel and you know so there is a, a real strong sense that there is a, a measure of happiness that we can can uh, attain in this life and so at the very end of the novel, I, without ruining it, I'll just mention that there is a kind of an upward tilt. Um, and I think that it's, I think that it, it's both a kind of an homage to novelists who I love, like Dickens, who were obsessed with doing this at the end of their novels. I love reading Dickens to my children, you know, while I was working on this novel. It's a better novel than it would have been because you know you talked about my prose style being dense and i totally agree and one of the things that i did to to write this novel was read dickens because he's his book, stories are so plot driven mm -hmm. and it really helped me to right. sort of you know acquire that well, some of your names are pretty dickensian character names yeah yeah and i i just yeah i and and i, and I love his novels in spite of the fact that they all end with these kind of happy endings but uh you know and that are maybe not not entirely satisfactory but I wanted there to be a combination of kind of realism and comic, comic up tilt. And so I've been thinking about this a lot for actually many years. And what I tried to do to achieve that is to finish the novel with one resolution, but that very resolution actually cracks open another irresolution that now needs to be dealt mm -hmm. with, if that makes sense. Right. Uh, and that, is both then kind of comically satisfying, but also accurate to life in that, you know, I think it's fair to say that any kind of happiness that we are able to achieve or grasp, we know that it's it's going to last maybe a few days or uh, a, a few years, right. and then there'll be some sort of downturn uh, regress or something that will threaten to, to take it away. Um, before we wrap up, I, I forgot to mention in my introduction, and this is a perennial problem with me because I don't write my intros out beforehand, and so I often forget to mention some key piece of information about my guests, but you are the founder and editor-in-chief of Wise Blood Books. We've talked about this before on the podcast. I just wanted to ask uh, what's coming up with, with your uh, publishing work. Yeah, so right. And uh, so with uh, if you don't mind me just – saying also that you know as, as some of the guests might know james matthew wilson and i founded the the first catholic master of fine arts at the university of saint thomas and i just returned i just returned from our i returned from our our residency uh which you know we've been doing zoom classes online all year that's great and i was i was able to to, to spend some time with over 30 of our students in person well you must have met my friend uh, matt kirby then yeah, well, yeah, he's a good Matt, friend of mine. Right, yeah, so Matt is a new student, yeah. uh, and we're we're delighted to have him aboard. But yeah, it was just, I mean, I, I have to just say that, I mean, it was such an occasion of tremendous joy to be there. And what really caught me off guard was that, uh, and I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but a lot of times with kind of literati type events, there can be this kind of uh, excessive irony or undue kind of coolness and hipness. Um, but this was full of total earnestness with regards to what we're about and creating literary art, but it was also just people who were very kind of joyful to be together, That's great. uh, in conviviality great. with one another. And so, um, I, I'm just so grateful to God that, that, that this thing that was supposedly not possible, which is the conjunction of excellence in art and total commitment to orthodoxy is indeed possible. And of course, with Wisebud, we're trying to pull something similar off. And we have a number of uh, projects that are kind of in the works. Uh, one of them is Sally Thomas's novel, 
Works of Mercy. Sally Thomas is, uh, I think, a poetry editor of the New York Sun, I believe. Forgive me if I'm I'm getting that wrong. And she's also the author of a poetry book called Motherland. And her novel is coming out at the end of summer. Uh, we also have an extended version of an essay called The Theology of Fiction, which was originally published in First Things, written by Cassandra Nelson. And we'll have a version of that that's two or 3,000 words longer. Nice. So I'm really grateful because I've been hearing a lot of really good things about that essay, and it stimulated a, a really good, great kind of uh, questions about the extent to which we can develop a psychology of goodness in fiction. So, you know, and, and especially as Catholics, the question of like, should we be actively committing ourselves to write good characters? Um, and then... We have uh, Dana Joya's uh, play, The Madness of Hercules, or excuse me, trans, it's not, Dana Joya's translation of Seneca's play, The Madness of Hercules. Mm. Uh, and that volume will include a long introductory essay on the nature of tragedy and on Seneca. Oh, fantastic. Um, and then the only other title that I'll mention for now is uh, a, a, a novella, Oops, uh, well, okay, I'll, 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 I'll leave off that one for now because I do want to mention, because I think this will be of interest to you, uh, a long narrative fantasy poem uh, called Saren of the Wildwood by Marley Humans, mm -hmm. uh, whose last not, uh, book came out through uh, Ignatius Karras in the World of Wonders. And so uh, I, I think I'm really excited about that because it's the first major work of fantasy that Wise Blood oh, that's great. has published. And, yeah, I need to read some uh, of her work. I, I have it, not read her at all yet, but I've heard good things. Yeah, from, uh, I mean, she's yeah. an extraordinarily gifted writer. So. That's great. And I know you have a Claudel thing, right? Yeah. So uh, we're bringing out uh, we're bringing out Paul, uh, Paul Claudel's play called The City. And this version of it will have an introduction by uh, Pater Edmund Waldstein, oh, nice. who runs the Josias. Um, and so he'll... I'm really looking forward to seeing what he what he ends up coming up with uh, as as his sort of introductory take on that play, maybe in light of kind of you know political questions that we're dealing mm. with now. Well, that all sounds very interesting. Um, I'm excited for all of those, and uh, thank you for bringing up the MFA program. I, I again, I I totally forgot to mention that <laughs> introducing oh, no, you. No, no worries. Um, I hope you don't mind me. No, no, I'm uh, happy you. I'm highlighting. I'm our glad students. that you brought it up. Um, yeah, and. Uh, Yes, people should definitely look that up if they're interested. Well, I'll, I'll link to the the website for the MFA uh, if anybody's interested in enrolling. Um, but uh, yeah, Josh, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, I enjoyed the novel, so it was great to talk to you about it. Thank you again so much for for reading it and for arriving at those those really great insights about especially Hape and a number of the other characters. It's really gratifying. So very grateful. Thank you. Tom. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so we're going to talk again soon, I guess, um, about your your essay, right? Greatly look forward to that as yeah. well. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Uh, so that won't be the next episode, I don't think, but people can, I, I, I think, look forward to that certainly before the summer's end, I would say. Um, and we'll we'll have to figure out exactly when. But yeah, uh -huh. thank you everybody uh, for listening, and please subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube. If you'd like to help us continue our our podcast network of this, of which this is only one of four of our podcasts at Catholic Culture, um, please do go to catholicculture.org slash uh, donate slash audio. I'll also mention actually two new things that are happening with the podcast network before I go. Uh, on Way of the Fathers with Mike Aquilina, we just started season two, where Mike is uh, discussing the first seven ecumenical councils. And uh, he already went through and profiled the the church fathers in chronological order. Um, so this is this is season two of Way of the Fathers. And then on Catholic Culture audiobooks, our voice actor James Majewski is uh, has just begun a reading of uh, Saint Francis de Sales' Introduction to the Devout Life. Um, which he'll be doing in installments over the next several months. So he's already put out the first two installments of that. And uh, if you haven't heard the Catholic Culture audiobooks, I urge you to go over there because uh, James is a, a, pro a professional uh, audiobook reader and uh, is putting this stuff out for free, works by the Fathers and Newman uh, and, and other 
classic Catholic works, even some poetry readings. He did uh, T.S. Eliot's Ash Wednesday on Ash Wednesday. Um, so do, do give that a listen, everybody. Uh, thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next time.